Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, so today, uh, Rich and I will be talking about uh, some of the data-related uh, aspects of you know bringing applications uh, onto Cloud Foundry. And I would like to start by just introducing you know myself, and then Rich will introduce uh, himself. Uh, so my name is Roman. I work at Pivotal as director of open source strategy. But today's talk uh, has nothing to do sort of with the vendor relationship. So today we're basically talking to you as members of this organization called ODPI, uh, which I will explain what it is and what it does. Uh, so all that we're going to talk about has to do with the two foundations, so DPI and Cloud Foundry Foundation, sort of figuring out some interesting aspects. You know, it doesn't really sort of relate to any of the vendor promises or any of the sort of product-related uh, concerns. Uh, so with that, I will let Rich introduce himself. Yeah, hi, my name is Rich Pelvin, and I'm co-founder and CTO of a startup called Reactor 8, and our focus is on configuration and automation. I've been working in this area first um, on the network side for over 20 years. So for 10 years on the network provisioning side, then for the last 10 years, been working on virtualization and more on the server app side. Also what informs the work I'm doing is um, I did a PhD in the area of artificial intelligence planning, which has the scope of trying to figure out how to generate plans or workflows given desired state seeing in the recent years that that's kind of the mode of configuration management describing end state, the AI work was very applicable in, in the stuff we do. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so I guess before I actually try to explain what ODPI is, uh, let me maybe decode one of the sort of, uh, you know, buzzwords on the slide, you know, title. Uh, so when we talk about data-driven applications, what do we really mean? Right? You know, Cloud Foundry is awesome, awesome technology for sort of traditional application uh, deployment. Uh, but I think the applications themselves are changing, right? You know, if uh, we used to deal with applications that are just, you know, traditionally sort of three-tier applications, you know, you have your database, you have your front end, stuff like that. What we're seeing more and more today is that those applications morph into being fundamentally dependent on the data models that are being a lot of times built either you know, offline or even more so, you know, more and more being built in real time you know, using streaming and big data analytics. And those applications behavior gets you know, completely sort of conditioned on how well those data models are maintained, you know, what kind of insight can you get from those data models. And it's a very different way of sort of bringing additional insight about you know, your customers or about you know, the uh, sort of industrial internet of things, you know, whatever it is that your application is managing. So there's this additional sort of set of concerns that all of a sudden you as an application developer has to uh, bring to the table uh, you cannot really abstract that away just the same way that you know, you, you're abstracting your relational database. So with that, let me try to explain sort of, uh, well, the agenda is, you know, we'll talk about ODPI and, you know, uh, then data app case study, uh, the prototype that Richard was, uh, uh, you know, and sort of his team was building. Uh, and finally, we'll just talk a little bit about, you know, the lessons learned and kind of sort of road ahead for all of us. So with that, uh, let's talk about ODPI. Uh, so, you know, at a very, very high level, uh, ODPI is basically trying to be to big data and especially sort of data science driven architecture, uh, what sort of Cloud Foundry Foundation is to Cloud Foundry and sort of this next generation platform as a service type of architecture. Uh, so we shared industry effort under the umbrella of the Linux Foundation, the same way that Cloud Foundry Foundation is sort of under the umbrella of Linux Foundation, uh, that is basically trying to figure out the path of big data technology towards a more consistent platform uh, for the enterprise. And of course, you know, these days uh, it means cloud as well as on-prem. Uh, what's interesting about us is that we're actually uh, a platform governed in a hybrid way. And what I mean by that is if in Cloud Foundry's foundation case, both sort of the platform aspects and development of individual projects, let's say Diego or you know, anything like that, belong to the same entity. In the case of ODPI, those two are separate. So in the case of ODPI, the projects that we leverage are all being developed as individual projects under the Apache sort of software foundation uh, management and you know, uh, uh, governance model. And what we're doing at ODPI, we're basically being opinionated in a sort of shared vendor context about how these different projects need to be 
put together, you know, to sort of represent a consistent platform? And what are the standards, what are the use cases that are driving the evolution of that platform? So essentially providing forcing function and a lot of use cases to the individual projects, while at the same time, individual projects are free to go and implement whatever else they want to implement. So you think of us, you know, in a different way, I guess, as a meta vendor. So you have your Cloudera, you have your Hortonworks, now you have ODPI. Uh, where a bunch of vendors are coming together and saying like, well, this big data platform needs to look this way, and here's the set of use cases that we will be tackling all together. Uh, so we are uh, expanding the platform to include, you know, the usual sort of buzzwords of who's who of Apache projects. Today, you know, with the release one, we are just uh, sort of standardizing on Hadoop and Ambari, but again, this is all the projects that we're definitely looking at. And finally, not to take, you know, too much time explaining what ODPI is, you know, it's a very sort of well-represented uh, organization in terms of the membership, so we nearly doubled the membership since 2015. And I'm really happy to uh, report that uh, within a year, actually less than a year of formal existence of the organization, we already came up with a runtime specification for how the big data platform needs to be, uh, uh, you know, needs to interact with its sort of applications. Uh, we also came up with the reference uh, implementation of that sort of reference uh, specification. And today, that is just a very traditional, you know, kind of view of how you deliver big data solution to your customer. So, you know, you have your RPM and Debian packages, you know, you have your Ambari or some other orchestration solution to basically roll out a you know, big data management cluster. It's a very, very traditional way. Uh, it's there, but it's a baseline. What's interesting to us is how can we tackle, again, at this meta vendor perspective, the sort of connection between the big data aspect and the cloud sort of aspect. The end goal, sort of the ultimate holy grail for us, is to be able to power the data-driven applications on Cloud Foundry. But the first step, you know, first steps first, right? You know, the first step that we have to do, we actually have to figure out how can we exist within the same substrate, and that same substrate, of course, means Bosch. So the rest of the presentation will be basically us trying to figure out uh, what's meaningful, what's working, what's not, in terms of just bringing the reference implementation of ODPI into the Cloud Foundry substrate. So I'll hand it over to Rich. It's on. Okay, I'm going to describe a, um, a case study and a prototype that we recently did that looks at using um, Bosch and BigTop to um, do a sample big data deployment. And we just chose as a sample deployment the uh, Spark cluster, Spark with HDFS and a Zeppelin front, front end. And we chose just, we started just a reference um, cloud um, platform was AWS. So um, along with trying to figure out how we could use Bosch and see the, um, what the gaps are, we also wanted to, to look at the problem of uh, one click, essentially trying to get towards one click deployment. The ability for, for example, a field engineer to go and wants to get a Spark cluster up and rather than having to bring up, follow Amazon instructions, um, spin up a director um, and, and a number of steps get started, is there any way we could just push a button basically, put in your Amazon credentials and all of a sudden you have a running uh, um, um, Spark Zeppelin cluster? Uh, the, the, um, this is um, ODPI um, is based on Big Top, so the idea was to understand requirements that we could bring back into ODPI. And um, as, as people know here, Bosch provides the abstraction layer. So although we did this initially on AWS, the idea would be to easily port this over to all the different platforms, um, infrastructure service platforms that Bosch um, supports. It was also being a, a prototype, the idea was to um, leverage off the shelf um, open source tools, and, and we'll go into that. So as far as leveraging BigTop, BigTop is a Apache project that, um, among other things, provides packaging for major um, um, big data services. Along with doing packaging, it also provides um, um, configuration logic 
that what's very nice, it's very, very tightly coupled with the packages. We think there is a kind of a big advantage to having configuration logic and packaging very tightly coupled. And, and we view um, recent emphasis on immutable infrastructure or containers as kind of recognizing the kind of there's a blurry line between packaging and assets and configuration management. So as far as leveraging Bosch, now um, my background is in DevOps and, and automation, but I came very new to Bosch. So part of this analysis was basically saying a newcomer who is familiar with tools in the area, understanding what is the learning curve and what are the challenges or what are the strengths of Bosch. So at the end I have some conclusion slides about where I think there's um, what was easy with Bosch, what I think is difficult, what I think there is opportunities to have focus in Bosch. Um, the thing we liked about Bosch clearly is giving us this infrastructure as a service uh, um, of, of, of abstraction, the robust node deployment, meaning that we don't have to directly interact with the cloud controllers or the uh, hypervisors, the ability that if nodes go down, the, um, um, that Bosch will automatically bring it up. Um, the other thing we really liked was the Bosch user experience. Um, the, the purpose here is to focus not on app deploy, but on dynamically configuring infrastructure. So we liked the way the Bosch CLI functioned to achieve that objective. Now, as far as looking at what the gaps are, um, the, the, the type of um, topologies that we've been looking at or have been tended to focus on big data topologies and other topologies that really have complex interaction between the nodes or the service demons, where what we seen will look like Bosch's strength with was dealing with a very specific topology, the case where you have um, a, a service that's horizontally scalable, very, it's a homogeneous um, service, and you want to roll that out. And um, what's, what's key there is they build in the canary strategy to make sure that if you make a mistake, you don't roll out the same mistake to 10,000 nodes. So although that makes it very easy if you're using the canary strategy, a lot of the topologies that we, we looked at have much more complex relationships, um, um, complex security configurations, complex high availability, just very basic um, configuring of HDFS and having the um, name node and the data, the data node find the name node, um, that, that, that didn't lend itself to this. Um, if a name node fails, that's very different from whether if a data node fails. fails. So um, that, that's one of the challenges that we had to get around. Um, so similarly, if a node fa fails in Bosch, it brings that node up. But in the topologies that we're looking at, sometimes not only you have to bring that node up, but there's connected services or connected nodes that have to bring up. Lastly, we, we, we had to represent more complex relationship between the configurations. And I see that in Bosch, there is new features that I think are starting to address that. Um, so um, these, they call them links. So that's something that's starting in the right direction. And some of the work we've done, I think, could really inform how links could evolve and, and, and really help to um, make it very easy to express the relationship between nodes and configurations. Another key challenge we found, and I'm gonna get back to this, is the lack of support for standard Linux packaging. The, 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 the technologies that I was very familiar with, um, things like Puppet or Chef or Ansible, they all worked around standard packaging. And um, um, so you could use those off the shelf and um, deploy your cluster. There's steps that do the installation, and then there's steps that do configuration and server start. Now, in looking at the description of Bosch, I understand the kind of high-level goal of you want to make sure the bits that you know get on the, on the, um, on the nodes. So you want to make sure there's, there's predictability and lack of uncertainty. Because many times, if you look at deploys that go to package managers, it fails because you lose connectivity, et cetera. Um, in, in the concluding slides, we talk about we think that the goal of getting predictable configuration and packages on the nodes, that clearly is key. But we think the way Bosch solves it is just one of different ways to solve it. And we have some suggestions about how Bosch could view that as one implementation of predictability and could extend out and actually treat package management. OK, so now I'm going to go into what the prototype architecture and the approach is. So the, um, the, 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 the approach for tackling um, 
the orchestration that we need draws from what's, what's very standard practice in service provider provisioning. What's interesting is if you looked at the history of provisioning and configuration management, 20 years ago, the service providers, network for service providers, were way ahead of the server and application folks. They had to um, automate things to bring up their 5 million um, um, subscribers for um, both the core network and DSL and cable, et cetera. So they really developed a very sophisticated approach and, uh, to the OSS and how they layered systems. And one of the key takeaways, what I think is very critical and still applies in the app space and in, in the data center space, is this whole notion of layering. So if you look at um, the way service providers look at an OSS, they look at, the, at one level, there's an element layer which is responsible for dealing with the network elements for the network side or dealing with nodes if you look at in the service side. And that looks at nodes one by one. And we viewed Bosch as really providing it. It gives you an abstraction, a nice, almost programmatic way of dealing with these nodes. But what's very key if you look at service provider networks is they think about not just elements, but they think about holistic services. So the analog in the, um, in the data center world is you have these distributed applications that you want to think of as one unit. You want to provision Spark as a black box service. You ideally would like to add capacity or SLA or security or high availability and not have to worry about the low level element layer coordination. So the way they, they, they actually design their, their OSS systems is they have an element layer and then you have a service layer on top of that that views service level abstractions and talks to the element layer to free itself from dealing with individual, the, the different type of um, elements you have to deal with. And that, that I think is extremely applicable in the, um, in the application, in, in application world. Um, the other issue we wanted to solve is we wanted an end-to-end -end orchestrator that not only could, once the um, Bosch director is up, could provision things, could actually spin up an Amazon network, could actually spin up Bosch, could automatically use Bosch init to um, generate a manifest and coordinate it with, with the, um, with, with, with the, the sub-network that you provision for Amazon. When we looked at the Bosch getting started guide and we looked at it, there was a big manual step for each service provider, how you go through an Amazon console and provision the subnets and make sure those exact same subnet IDs are in your manifest. We think there was potential to do this all in um, one system. So we had, we, we introduced an orchestrator that lived above Bosch that provided this capability and used Bosch as an element management system. So if you look at um, what the architecture looks like, so the first step would be that you have an orchestrator where there's nothing there and aside from Amazon credentials and it works in two modes. It could either discover subnets that are there or it could, by giving it a VPC, or it could actually provision those subnets. After that, what it does is it provisions, it spins up a client node, provision, uses Bosch init to an uh, automatic manifest to spin up Bosch director. In this case, for AWS, we would pick the appropriate CPI, and we'd get to a state where Bosch, um, where Bosch director is up, and then we use that as effectively our element layer system. We, I mentioned that we really liked the Bosch CLI. So being a prototype, what we did is we, we did a very simple hack on the Bosch client to have everything go to the Bosch director except for the deploy command. And so when you, so it looks exactly like you're using Bosch CLI, but when you do the step to de deploy, it talks to the orchestrator. For this project, we used something that um, um, my company just open source, which is a end-to-end um, -end orchestrator. And a key part of it is having a manifest-like language that um, is much more application and service focused than Bosch, but it actually fits nicely in that from our um, manifest, we could generate a Bosch um, manifest. So the input to the, to the um, whole system is a description of your application, the topology, how th things link together. You kick up a deployment. What the orchestrator does is then tells Bosch to spin up nodes. Now what we did with Bosch is we just built one package that spins up our agent so then the orchestrator could talk directly to the nodes. 
Ideally, we wouldn't have to, if Bosch made it easier for us to install packages, ideally we'd do everything through um, the, the Bosch director. But it was, um, we found it very time consuming to build packages. And just, I'll just go over this very fast, but um, our manifest, um, it's XML, which is not the important point, is, but it represents both um, um, what's on nodes and it breaks things into components. So node is composed of components. So in this case, for example, on a master node, you would have a Spark master and a Zeppelin server. On the worker node, you would have uh, workers and things. And it also has, we've been working with it for about four years now, um, links that link between services to show the dependencies. Um, this lends itself very nicely. We think we could translate this directly to Bosch manifest. Another important aspect, though, is actually having a workflow. Um, I know in the state-based uh, um, world, they say, well, either you have a workflow or you have an end state description, and there has been definitely ten trend towards going to state-based systems. But if you start to drill into what AI planning did, you could, you could really harmonize the two approaches. So the way we look at it is that um, if you could if you just give an end state, will automatically generate a workflow. But many times in these, this area, you want to have a much more sophisticated workflow. For example, when you bring up a Spark cluster, you first want to bring up HDFS. You want to do smoke tests to make sure that it's up. Then you want to bring up Spark, et cetera. So you have arbitrary different type of workflows you want. And as I said, there's ways that you could really unify the workflow as being viewed as the plan that's achieving the end state and you get harmony between the two. Now, because we had to um, um, reach out to outside package manager, just some lower level details is we just had to spin up a NAT instance and the system that we, we, we um, the DDK system dealt with all the service discovery slash IP address management. So we opened up a NAT instance that allowed us to connect outside to a package manager and then for the only external service we had, we used it to port map to Zeppelin. And this was spun up initially, if you look at what the orchestrator is doing, initially it would spin up a Bosch ADFs, AWS director and a NAD instance. And then later on, when it spun up the cluster, it would hook this up to the NAD instance and give it the appropriate connectivity. And if you look at um, a kind of lower level view of the interaction between the um, orchestrator and Bosch, initially the orchestrator would go and talk to Amazon with the credentials, discover or provision the subnets. It would then, with that information, generate a manifest and it would um, spin up the Bosch director. Um, it would then talk, if you do a deploy, it would then talk to Bosch, which had a manifest that simply had the same, um, every node just was a simple bare bones OS with a DDK agent on it. Bosch then would spin things up. We would use, um, we would then talk to Bosch to get the node state, and then directly we would talk to our agent and execute the workflow with our orchestrator. Uh, this is just a little more low-level description of the same thing, so I'm going to skip this slide. And just in concluding, uh, um, what did we really learn and where we think there's room for improvement? So the plan to view Bosch as an element layer system and to integrate it with a service level orchestrator worked out really nicely. The manifest that we had to generate the Bosch level was very easy to generate from the um, DSL that we had at the service level. The thing that we found challenging was that um, the only Bosch packages we built was for the DDK agent. And this is an agent that we've had running for a while on many different operating systems and scripts that w worked out of the box, where when we ported it over to Bosch because the non-standard OS layout and things like temp had different um, 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 permission rights, we had to really hack up and build our own version of these, of these um, scripts. So where we really think there could be benefit to Bosch is, as I said, viewing Bosch as really providing what I think now they're really focusing on. To us, Bosch is really, was one of the first systems that um, provided immutable infrastructure. How do you get 
bits there, how do you, rather than focus on incremental changes, you just rip and replace. We think it did a real nice job of it. On the other hand, we believe that the implementation that forces you to um, translate everything to Bosch packages is extremely cumbersome. So we only translated one or two packages. If we translated all the big top packages that worked out of the box, we think that would be a big challenge. We, um, in the big talk project, we have, um, um, all, we have the benefit of all engineers who are working on one effectively golden store, a set of packages and aligned configuration scripts. So if we then translated that and wrote porting, we could write an importing tool. If we port it over to um, Bosch, you're, lo you're leaving um, l um, an area for making mistakes in that porting. It'd be much easier if they natively could support um, 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 the, um, standard Debian and RPM packages. And so simple ideas like if you want to control the um, exactly what gets on a bit, you use a standard enterprise um, um, topology where your package manager is behind the firewall and you just vet getting things in the firewall. So you have the package manager on your lower, on your, um, on your secure network, you know exactly what's on it, and you're using the standard apt and RPM protocols to do that. We also think there's some very interesting opportunities too to view, um, as, as people are starting to view um, containers or the artifacts. I know Bosch could treat um, um, containers like another infrastructure as a service, but we think Bosch could also benefit by looking at um, um, a new type of build. What they're really building is containers, building images as opposed to building um, um, a Bosch package that then gets installed. So that, that, that concludes the talk. I think, do you, um, Roman, do you want to wrap up talk, talk a little more about big talk? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, so thanks. Um, so yeah, so that was basically the extent of the prototype. Uh, it's a very recent work uh, that, you know, we've just completed maybe, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so it is still at the prototype stage. Uh, but what's interesting is it kind of sparked this interest in essentially orchestration frameworks, you know, coming to big top and trying to you know, integrate with the way that BigTop manages the Hadoop ecosystem. And by the way, BigTop is sort of the underlying build and you know, management system of the ODPI as well. So we now have you know, Canonical's Juju you know, that is also trying to integrate with BigTop. You know, there's the prototype that uh, we've done. And I think you know, if you are finding yourself in an environment where you all have to support application developers and you know, data science team and let's say you know, have some kind of a data lake sort of architecture in place, now is really good time to get involved, uh, and you don't even have to sort of you know formally join you know any of the foundations. Like you don't have to wait for your company to be, you know, a formal member of the ODPI or Cloud Foundry Foundation. Uh, like I said, I mean, an interesting sort of model that we're trying with ODPI is that the governance of the individual projects, you know, including BigTop, is still done at the Apache Software Foundation. So all you need to do to basically start you know hacking on all of this stuff. Uh, is to just you know join the Big Top project or you know send us an email on the mailing list, uh, and it's an Apache project. So again, as you probably know, Apache is you know extremely well optimized for individual developers collaboration. So there is no you know uh, uh, barrier of entry. Like all it takes is just an email you know to a mailing list or a Jira you know that you can open. So I can just uh, would like to leave you with that thought that you know again if this is the kind of problem that you know you find yourself today struggling with, or you see sort of your infrastructure going into that direction, uh, there are extremely easy ways to get involved and you know, just uh, sort of get, get, get a message to us you know, on the big top mailing list and we would be happy to collaborate with you. Uh, so with that, I guess we have you know, about maybe uh, you know, seven minutes or whatever for question and answers. Um, so Rich and I would be more than happy to um, answer anything. Um, so anybody, you know, So the question is, you know, why are we trying to integrate with Bosch? So I think, you know, uh, Rich, you talked about, you know, some of these sort of uh, interesting capabilities in Bosch that, you know, we really found useful. So even if it wasn't sort of for the Cloud Foundry integration exercise, so Rich, can you maybe talk a little bit again about, you know, yeah, this, sure. those capabilities? Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I think part of the, 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 the prototype was actually understanding if, if Bosch was suitable for what we did. So the initial thing that attracted us to Bosch was the fact that it gives you this infrastructure as a service um, 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 abstraction and whether that could be leveraged. So that, that was a thing. So, um, but yeah, there, there, there really was trade-offs there. So um, um, as I said, I think I, we really like to kind of their paradigm of uh, doing the compilation. So I think it lends itself to, I said, if you look at what they're doing with Docker workloads, where a lot of times you describe the, your, your configuration state and you try to compile things in, we think it lends itself to it. So it's, the overall workflow lends itself to that. And just to add, you know, a little bit of a big data, I guess, perspective, uh, today there is not really a sort of, you know, easily sort of uh, obtainable path to the multi-cloud, you know, if you're doing sort of big data, right? Uh, so, you know, there are different solutions, you know, from different vendors. But what we were looking for is something that could be robustly governed. And Bosch, being part of the Cloud Foundry Foundation, gives you that property, right? And again, maybe there will be a tool that would come out of, I don't know, uh, Cloud Native Compute Foundation, right? And if at some point they do, again, that would be yet another choice. But for now, if you look at the landscape, you know, there are vendor tools. There are tools, you know, like the tools from HashiCorp. And that's basically it. I mean, there is not really anything that could reliably get you uh, across, across the cloud plus, you know, the data center sort of uh, framework. Any, any other questions about ODPI, you know, Bosch, anything? Right, well, okay. thank you. Thanks, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay.